church, if you would, go ahead and join me in your copy of God's Word in Matthew, the 20th chapter, Matthew chapter 20. If you don't have a copy of God's Word for yourself, there's probably one in the pew rack in front of you, or feel free to use your device, whether that's your phone, an iPad, uh, desktop, laptop, flat panel TV screen, <laughs> whatever, you can, whatever you can get away with this morning, but join me, if you would, in Matthew the 20th chapter. So far, as we have been making our way with Jesus and his disciples toward Jerusalem, they are, have been in the land on the other side of the Jordan River. And so far, Jesus has taught his disciples and us that we must love our families, that we must love him supremely and trust him without reservation. The rich young ruler was a man who had trouble loving Jesus more than he loved his stuff. We've already preached on that, so if I talk about it more, that's stopping preaching and going to meddling, so we're going to let that one just stay right where it is. The disciples also needed to learn to trust in God's provision of grace and that he would be the one who decided how he would save individuals. This morning, the message that we're going to look at is closely tied to those previous two that we have looked at. And I want us to begin this morning, we're actually going to be in verse 17 through the end of the chapter, but I want us to start by looking specifically at verse 20. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him, that is Jesus, with her sons. And kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. And Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, We are able. And he said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and to sit at my left is not mine to grant. But it, has, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. Now, church, there, there's an awful lot going on in this passage. Jesus had just told the disciples that he was going to Jerusalem to be crucified. This was the third time that he had shared that information, that he was going to be going to Jerusalem and he would be crucified. We find that in beginning in verse 17 where Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. He took the 12 disciples aside and on the way he said to them, See, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And he will be raised on the third day. This is the most complete description of what is going to take place that Jesus has given them to date. In fact, every time that he told them, look, we're going to Jerusalem, he gave them a little bit of new information. And on this particular occasion, he adds that he will be resurrected from the dead. The resurrection is introduced at this point. And what I find completely interesting, Matthew does not record for us any discussion about that revelation. In fact, it's not just Matthew. None of the gospel writers give us any indication that that revelation that he was going to be resurrected from the dead, let alone that he was going to be crucified, they had already heard that, but that he was going to be resurrected from the dead, it was like they did not hear at all. It's almost like the disciples were fixated on something else. Because the next thing that Matthew tells us 
is that Mama Thunder comes to ask Jesus for places of honor for the sons of thunder. I want them to have the most prominent places in the kingdom. Now, where would they have come up with that idea? See, they never got over. Have you ever had a conversation with someone and they tell you something that just kind of captures your imagination and then they keep on talking about something completely different and then they ask you a question and you're like, huh, well, I, I didn't hear anything you said. I'm still stuck back here with what you said earlier. Well, back in chapter 19, Jesus had said to the disciples in verse 28, he had said to them that when Peter said, see, we've left everything, Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world, when I make all things new, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones. Oh, that's what we're shooting for here. And everything else, that just, it's like they forgot about that whole part where Jesus said, the first will be last and the last will be first. Right over their heads. They didn't, didn't hear one word of that. They missed the entire parable of the vineyard where again Jesus said in verse 16 that the last will be first and the first will be last. And they certainly missed that part about the cross. It's like they were saying, forget the cross, give me my crown. Now, church, before we get too judgy-judgy toward the disciples, I, I want us to be real clear. I want us to all be very transparent, maybe not with each other, but certainly before the Lord. We struggle with the same things they struggled with. Can I be confessional here for just a minute? I like it when people tell me that I do a good job with something. I like it a lot. In fact, I probably like it too much. I liked it back in the 1990s and early 2000s when I traveled across the state of Alabama doing church growth conferences for the Alabama Baptist State Convention. And when people looked at this little 30-something-year-old kid and they thought I had something good to say, I liked it. Just like I liked it this past week, some of you know I was on a national podcast telling the story of Huffman, a podcast that is listened to by thousands of people. I like it. I like it when people recognize that I do a good job at something. And if I'm not careful, hear me now, because all of us have something, a sphere where we find ourselves in the same spot. If I'm not careful, I will find myself taking my place on one of those thrones to Jesus' right and Jesus' left. And while I might not totally push him off of his throne, I might climb up there with him. We struggle with the same stuff. But here's the thing. If we seek glory for ourselves, we cannot glorify Jesus completely. That's why we must constantly remind ourselves, why I must constantly remind myself the words of John the Baptist. He must increase and I must decrease. And for him to increase and for me and you to decrease, we must be aware at least of the temptation towards self-promotion. Now I want us to look at James and John's request a bit closer, or rather their mother's request on their behalf. How embarrassing is that, by the way? Two grown men have to have their mother go and ask for something on their behalf? Now, I'll be real honest, my, my mother would have been glad to ask for something on my behalf. And I probably, hopefully, maybe, would have had enough 
pride about myself that I would have said, Mom, let that alone. How embarrassing that Mama goes and asks. Now, Matthew implies that there were actually two requests that she made. Because it says that then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. There's the first ask. Matthew doesn't tell us what it is. Mark does. Mark, in his account, says, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. A blank check. I remember as a child trying to play that with my parents. I remember as a parent, our children trying to play that with us. And I recognize it now with our grandchildren who actually get away with it. Why the three of them thought they could get away with it isn't real clear. Maybe they were banking on that close relationship between Jesus and John. After all, John was known as the disciple whom Jesus loved, or at least that's what he said of himself in his gospel. Maybe there was some truth to the church tradition that Salome, their mother, was a sister to Mary, the mother of Jesus. By the way, there's no biblical evidence of that, not directly anyway, but, but that was church tradition. But whatever their thoughts, Jesus didn't fall for it. He made them make their specific request. Matthew says that Salome was the one who asked the questions, but Jesus did not respond to her. He responded to them. You do not know what you're asking. Both pronouns are in the second person, plural. If Jesus had been from the southern United States, he would have said, y'all don't know what y'all are asking. And this really falls under the category of be careful what you ask for. Because Jesus followed that up with, and are y'all able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? The cup of the full measure of God's wrath poured out on Jesus on the cross for the sins of the world? The cup was the cup of suffering. It was the cup of death that Jesus had just finished telling them about. Betrayal by one of his own. Denial by one who was close. Mocked, flogged, crucified. It was a cup that was so horrifying that Jesus himself prayed, Father, if it is possible, let this cup fall from me. Yet not as I will but your will be done. Are y'all sure you can handle the cup that is before me? And in their arrogance, yeah, Jesus, we got this. We can handle it. And Jesus says, well, it's good because you will. If you keep following me, you in fact will. James was martyred. John was exiled to the island of Patmos. Both experienced suffering. They paid the price. But Jesus said, even that is not enough to get you those two places of honor. God the Father has already decided who that is. It may be you, I don't know. But that's his decision. When all things are made new. By the way, did you notice the reaction of the other ten? They were indignant. And I don't think it was righteous indignation. I think it was more envious resentment. Who do you think that you are that you would ask for those two positions? But what about the rest of us? Are you any better than us? See, they were jealous. But in the kingdom of heaven, self-promotion doesn't work. And so Jesus used their selfish request to teach what does. And it is self-sacrifice. I'm reminded of Paul's words to the church, to the Christians in Rome. He said, I implore you, brothers, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living 
sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. Now that statement of presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice is written in a way that suggests this is a continual action. Something that must be done over and over again. And the reason for that is if you take a dead sacrifice and you place that dead sacrifice on the altar, it's not moving. It has no temptation to slip off of the altar. But if you take a living sacrifice that is still breathing, that is still active, that is still alive, and you place that living sacrifice on the altar, do you know what we have a tendency to do? We want to slip off the altar and we want to sit on a throne because that is much more appealing. And so Paul said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. Jesus had told the twelve that when he made all things new that they would rule and reign with him. Now he makes it clear what that looks like. And it doesn't look like what they thought it was. It doesn't look like the normal rule and reign of someone in that day and even in our day who is in authority. We pick up with verse 25. But Jesus called them to him and said, now this is right after they have asked for those two places of authority. He said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus has been talking about the first shall be last and the last shall be first, and now he explains what that means. You see, these disciples, not just the two, but the other ten who were indignant that they asked for those positions because they wanted them for themselves, they were acting like worldly leaders who rule from positional authority. Jesus said they lord it over people. Their greatness comes from their power. That was practiced by virtually everyone. It was any, any position of authority in those days, whether it was a king or a pharaoh or a Caesar or even a religious leader of that time. They ruled through intimidation. They ruled through threat. They ruled through manipulation. Jesus said they lord it over their people, but he also said that those who are great among them exercise authority again over that's not the way it's supposed to be with followers of Jesus. If we choose the Jesus way, we're not doing something over someone else. We're serving. The way to greatness is not the way of power or authority. It is the way of sacrifice. Jesus said, whoever wants to be great must be a servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave. I want you to think about it like this. I, I think in pictures, and so I'm going to try to paint a picture for you here. If you can picture in your mind a pyramid, all right, so you've got a, a triangular base, then you've got the, the sides of the pyramid. Kathy, what are those called? The sides of a triangle? Yeah, there you go. So you got, you got the lines there, and so it's, the pyramid is the base, and then you got it coming up, and so worldly authority, worldly power, the way that the world looks at things is that there's someone at the top and they are standing on the backs of everyone who is below them. We, we can picture that, can't we? Right away our minds go to examples that we have seen throughout the course of history of people who have risen to power, risen to the top of an organization or a country or a region, whatever it happens to be, and they've done it by, by standing on the backs of others. But in the kingdom of heaven, that is flipped. And whoever is at the apex of the triangle 
they are at the bottom and they have on their back all of the people who are above them. The one who stands alone at the bottom of the pyramid is carrying the weight of those that he leads, those that she serves. Now, I want you to notice something. Jesus did not necessarily condemn the desire for greatness. We all, I mean, there's something built within us, and I think it is part of our supernatural DNA. It is part of the image of God that is within us. There is a desire for us to have significance, to leave our mark upon the world. For when we are gone, for people to say, hey, there is a vacuum there because he or she is no longer here. They did something significant. Jesus didn't say that was wrong. But what he did was to redefine the meaning of greatness as well as the motive and the method to achieving greatness. This kind of greatness is pleasing to God because it is humble. It is self-giving. Worldly greatness comes from pleasing men and being served by men. Greatness in God's eyes comes from pleasing Him and serving people. And Jesus said you have to be a willing servant. That word servant in the Greek is diakonos, which gives us the title for what we use as deacon. And the word literally means through the dust. You must be a willing servant ready to serve in the dirty places of life. In fact, Jesus said, you must be like a slave. Now, there's a difference between a slave and a servant. A servant maintains some, some level at least of of uh, freedom, of, of um, the ability to make some choices for himself or herself. But a slave was given over to the master. And so a slave only went where the master told him to go, only did what the master told him to do. And so as I begin to think about this in terms of my relationship with Jesus, for him to increase in my life and for me to decrease in my life, I must abandon self-promotion and embrace self-sacrifice by being a servant and a slave to Jesus and his people. Being a servant and a slave to the church. Being a servant and a slave to my family. Being a servant and a slave to my coworkers, my friends, those who are within my sphere of influence. Being a servant and a slave to my neighbors. In church, I can tell you that requires a healthy dose of humility. As Jesus and his entourage continued on their journey, at some point they crossed over the Jordan. We're not told when that was. And they made their way to Jericho. And that's where we pick up in verse 29. As they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And the crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Now, there are two times that Jesus responds to those who are crying out to him in the passage we've looked at. The first was when Salome asked Jesus a question, and he said, What are you asking? What do you want for me? And the answer was, I want something that is selfish. Here again, these men are calling out to Jesus. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? Their response was one of humility. Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jericho was the last major city on the road 
to Jerusalem. From here, Jesus would spend his time. He would go up the 3,000 feet or so from the Jordan Valley where Jer Jericho was located to the mountains where Jerusalem was located. And from here, he would split his time between a town called Bethany and Jerusalem, going back and forth between the two. And as Jesus and his disciples began to make that journey, that's where we encounter these two blind beggars. Mark tells us in his account that one of them was named Bartimaeus. I remember as a kid learning about blind Bartimaeus. And in spite of the crowd's insistence that they keep quiet, Bart Bartimaeus and his buddy persistently cried out. There was a sense of desperation. Because they had heard about Jesus, and, and this may be their only shot, their only time to get help from the son of David. Now, I find it interesting, they were physically blind, but they had spiritual sight. So, Pastor, why do you say they had spiritual sight? Could, it, could this not have just been two guys who wanted Jesus to do for them what he had done for so many and bringing healing to their bodies? Could that have been a selfish request? Yes, it could have. And certainly there was a certain amount of that. Any of us who have any kind of infirmity, any of us who have any kind of difficulty that we face, any kind of storm that we're going through, we want relief. And so we call out to him. But their calling out was different. There was spiritual sight that was involved because they addressed him not only as Lord, which could have been a sign of respect to anyone that they looked up to, a respected rabbi, certainly would have been called Lord from their perspective, two beggars. But they didn't stop with Lord. They also called him the Son of David, which was clearly a messianic title. And so in some way, and we don't, certainly they couldn't comprehend all that that meant. They didn't understand any more than the disciples understood about what that was, but they recognized Jesus as Messiah. Their eyes had been opened spiritually even though they could not see physically. And they recognized their total unworthiness. Not we deserve to have our sight restored because we recognize that you are the Messiah. Have mercy on us. Totally unworthy of his attention, let alone his action. That's a stark contrast between the request of James and John and the other disciples who somehow felt they deserved a place of honor. And, and so the reality is that because of their faith, not only did they get their sight restored, but Matthew tells us that they followed Jesus. Again, Mark gives us a little more insight. Mark says that Jesus not only touched their eyes and they were able to see, but he actually said something to them. He said, your faith has made you well. Not your faith has opened your eyes, your faith has re 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 restored your sight, but your faith has made you well. And that word well in the original language is a word that means salvation. Your faith has saved you. That's the way it's used everywhere else in the New Testament. And so that day they walked from the darkness of physical blindness to the light of sight. But they also walked from the darkness of sin into the marvelous light of salvation. These blind men were a great example of humility. The last becoming first because they were willing to be the last to begin with. But if they are an example, Jesus is the standard. I point you back to verse 28 where Jesus said, Even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for men. That day, Jesus served these two undeserving blind beggars. Even as he continued on the road to Jerusalem where he would serve the rest of us by giving his life as a ransom for many. Luke tells us in his account of Bartimaeus 
that Bartimaeus went away from there glorifying God. It's as if heaven came down and glory filled his soul. And that was the point of the day. That was the point of everything that Jesus was teaching his disciples, whether it was through a direct statement, whether it was through the parable, or whether it was through this example of what Jesus did for these men. He wanted his disciples, and he also wants us to know, you cannot glorify God if you're seeking glory for yourself. It takes the kind of humility that is willing to sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. So church, if Jesus is our king, if we really look to him as the Lord of our lives, we must receive and practice his instructions to love him supremely, to obey him without reservation, and to glorify him completely. And here's the thing. If we do that, in spite of all of the storms around us, we will be able to raise our hallelujah because he will share his life with us. Life both now and for eternity. I choose the Jesus way. And I trust that you do as well. Father, we thank you today. Some of the hard lessons of life. And God, we confess that we can be stubborn we can be slow learners. And God, we thank you for your patience. Father, for me personally, when I'm tempted to slip off the altar as a living sacrifice and to sit on a throne, Father, be patient with me. But remind me that my call, our call, is a call of humble self-sacrifice, servanthood, even to the point of being your slave. God, knowing that you are a good taskmaster, that you love us, that you have called us according to your purpose. And therefore, everything in our lives, when we trust you, God, you are working those things for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.